Assalamualaikum. Very good afternoon. Yang berhormat Senator Tengku Datuk Sri Zafur Tengku Abdul Aziz, Minister of Finance Malaysia. Section 3, Mr. Wolan Kalara, Ambassador Designate of France to Malaysia. Tuan-tuan dan puan-puan, ladies and gentlemen, Mita Bin Malaysia. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you for this special dialogue and webinar on the occasion of CCI France Malaysia's courtesy call to Yang Bumat uh, Minister at his office in Putrajaya. First of all, we'd like to express our sincere thanks, uh, Wabi Minister, and to you and your team for taking time off of your busy schedule to welcome us for this one hour dialogue session with the French business community in Malaysia. Also, a warm welcome to Malaysia, to His Excellency uh, Monsieur Ambassador, uh, France to Malaysia. We really appreciate your presence and once again, welcome to Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. Thank you also to the representatives of the 10 companies. We have 10 companies with us in person, uh, YD, uh, present here today, and to our members joining this dialogue session online. Malaysia and France have a very strong and long standing business ties dating back to well before Madeka, and the logo is appearing on the slide. The slide should, should uh, appear. There you go. So you see there quite a number of logos, and these companies are testimonial of the presence in Malaysia of most of the Cat 40, which represents the largest companies in France. The trade, uh, Minister, between our two countries is steady and consistent, as you can see there from the slide treat both ways is uh, very strong and consistent and aligned with uh, the aspirations of the country and also along the sectors of aeronautics, infrastructure and halal products as well. The employment generated is also in line with the government's aspiration, high skill, high tech, directly and indirectly by French companies in Malaysia and it stands currently at about 30,000 employment generated. Meanwhile, the conducive business climate, good infrastructure and support of the Malaysian authorities have allowed many French companies to use Malaysia as a regional hub. And you will note by the minister that a third of the French companies present in Malaysia are actually entrepreneurs with no direct link to France who have chosen Malaysia as the right place to start activities for Malaysia and also the region. In this context, and given the current complicated local and inter international economic situation, we are glad, Wai Bin Minister, to be here with you to exchange ideas and look forward to getting your views on what's in store for Malaysia in 2021. Before that, I'd like to invite His Excellency Mr. Roman Talarak, our new ambassador of France and Malaysia, to say a few words. Ambassador. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Kru again. Uh, many thanks for hosting us today. As uh, we have just heard, France and Malaysia are very strong economic partners, but I would say uh, that partnership goes much beyond that. And in fact, I think we are strategic partners. We share the same view of the value of the multilateral system. We share the same view of this uh, region, which we think should be a space for cooperation, not a theater for confrontation. And as we are looking beyond the current uh, pandemic crisis, all of our countries, certainly in the European Union, but also here in Malaysia, have started to put together recovery plans. In the European Union, uh, these recovery plans are basically uh, relying on the need uh, for a green transition, which is seen as an opportunity. And I would be particularly interested, Minister, if you could uh, perhaps uh, in your talk uh, flash out the uh, Malaysian government's approach to these uh, uh, issues. But again, thank you very much, Niku, for hosting us. Thank you, um, Mr. Ambassador. Yang Mohamad, Menteri, would now like to invite you to deliver your keynote address to the French business community. Minister, mm -hmm. please. Thank you. Well, I'll just have a brief um, introduction. It's not really a keynote address. Um, so again, thank you, Dr. Zainal and His Excellency and the team for coming here. Um, perhaps I can start with giving you a brief overview of the recent budget that was announced. Um, as you know, 
It has been approved at the policy stage uh, last Thursday, uh, 26th of November, and now we're going through the various committee stages. Uh, today is the fourth day. Uh, we've got through, I think, um, many ministries, if not mistaken, 11 ministries already uh, this week. Uh, the process is an ongoing process. It will end on the 15th of December, and hopefully, uh, if and once we get all the approval from the ministries, so then the budget will then be uh, tabled to the Senate uh, before the final approval and signing off uh, by the King. Um, so now, you know, allow me just to give you a brief overview, like I said, of the budget. Uh, as a recap, uh, actually the government has announced four mini budgets before this, uh, which is the stimulus packages uh, that we announced uh, since uh, March this year. These are recovery packages amounting to close to 305 billion ringgit. Uh, that's about uh, 75 billion US dollars. And this is uh, estimated to give a boost to our economy for the year 2020 between 3.7 to 4% to GDP. Uh, the forecast for 2020 is between negative 4.5 to negative 5.5 in terms of GDP growth. Uh, of course, we're in a recession. Um, so uh, another 150 countries in the world this year, which will re record uh, negative growth in GDP. Uh, ha having said that, uh, we had some uh, good uh, promising uh, performance in the third quarter. Uh, the third quarter GDP uh, growth was negative uh, 2.6 or negative 2.7, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that is the best uh, performance in the region after uh, first quarter, second quarter growth of negative 17.1. So building on this recovery, uh, the momentum recovery based on these uh, stimulus packages, the budget 2021 uh, will, we believe, will further contribute uh, to the growth for our economy in 2021. It is, as you have seen, an expansionary budget. It's the last, the biggest fiscal spending that we've ever done uh, in a budget. Uh, and it is a, a counter-cyclical move uh, by the government. Uh, it's worth 322.5 billion ringgit or around close to 80 billion US dollars. Uh, and we'll focus on three main objectives. Uh, firstly, is the people's well-being. Um, secondly, business continuity. And thirdly, economic resilience. Right? So the government's goal is, you know, continues to be uh, safeguarding the economy uh, while continuing to invest uh, in the future. Uh, this will be done through digitalization and innovation. Um, education as well as raising awareness uh, on sustainability and the circular economy. Uh, budget 2021 is expected to add around 4% uh, to GDP for 2021. Uh, for everyone's information, the uh, our GDP projection, as I mentioned, for, uh, sorry, I've not mentioned this actually, for 2021 uh, is between 6.5% and 7.5% to GDP growth. Uh, it's based on various factors, including projections made uh, by other institutions such as IMF uh, and ADB and World Bank uh, it's within that range. Uh, and if you can see, uh, actually, Malaysia has amongst the highest growth uh, in Asia for 2021. Uh, this, just for your information, we are assuming that the budget, the budget assumes you, uh, oil price around $42 per barrel. Right? Uh, we expect the multiplier impact of this uh, private consumption growth uh, and GDP to be, uh, like I said, 4% uh, of GDP. For budget 2021, uh, again, I would like to stress that the priority of the fiscal stand goes towards protecting the economy, uh, livelihood of the people and supporting the businesses. Right? The government is committed to support the economic recovery uh, while adhering to the debt uh, and fiscal rules. Um, the fiscal consolidation, I think, will happen eventually, gradually, uh, in accordance uh, to the needs of the economy. So we will, for now, continue to focus on execution, right, and ensuring that the right assistance reaches to the people who need it most. Uh, we will also balance between the short-term economic recovery and the long-term sustainable growth. If uh, the crisis prolongs, right? And we hope that doesn't, uh, it's not the case, but the government is ready uh, to intensify uh, its efforts uh, in supporting the people and economy. So before I end, uh, I'd like to highlight that we have started to see positive impact from the stimulus packages that we announced. Uh, we've seen, as I mentioned, just now, smaller contraction in GDP growth, uh, GDP 
uh, in terms of GDP number, it was negative 2.7%. Uh, just to give you a comparison, Philippines was negative 12 and a half, Thailand was negative 6.4, Singapore was negative 7, and Eastern Indonesia was negative 3.5. And un unemployment numbers have also been re reduced. At a peak, it was around 5.3% in May, went down to 4.9, and 4.7, and announced 4.6 uh, for September. Mm -hmm. Uh, regional markets, nations, stock markets have done very well. We are the only one that is in a positive territory in year to date in terms of our Colombo stock market. And in the ringgit bond market, uh, demand remains strong. So that's why we were able to fund the stimulus packages. We actually saw an inflow uh, in the ringgit uh, bond market, uh, close to 32 billion ringgit uh, from overseas investors or non resident uh, investors. Uh, so, ringgit performance uh, it is also one of the few countries in ASEAN where the currency actually strengthened against the US dollar. Uh, so without taking much more time, uh, now I hand it back to Dr. Zainal uh to open the floor for questions uh, for a meaningful discussion. Thank you. And thank you, Vice Minister, for your very comprehensive message. So we shall now proceed with the dialogue session. As mentioned earlier, some of the main French companies in Malaysia are present here today. So as I invite you, please keep your question brief and straight to the point as we want to allow more time to dialogue with the minister. So first up, ladies first, mm -hmm. I'd like to invite uh, Madame Laurence Noel, Senior Vice President Group PSA, to introduce herself and ask your question, please. Thank you, Zena. So I'm Laurence Noel, as I said, I'm the Vice President, uh, Senior Vice President of Southeast Asia for uh, PSA Group. And as you know, Group PSA is a car manufacturer, European models portfolio of six brands, Peugeot, Citroën, DS, Opel, Vauxhall, and uh, Free to Move, which is a mobility brand. And as you probably know, so Group ESA is now in the process of the merger with uh, Fiat Chrysler, um, which will uh, allow us to become a big group, Stellantis, already the name is known, and we will become a that force of car manufacturer worldwide with a portfolio of uh, 16 brands. Within the region, our industrial footprint covers Vietnam um, and also Malaysia, where we all a plant in Gomun, uh, Keda, mm. uh, aiming to be our export hub for the region. Uh, roughly, already 60% of our production is uh, exported today. Uh, we also decided to make Malaysia our hub when it comes to R&D, procurement, sales and marketing for the region, and also the activity for Group PSA worldwide. So my question, and I'm going to try to make it short, uh, hmm. is, as you know, the car, the car industry requires technology, huge investment, and it's a long development time with decisions made uh, far uh, in advance uh, and based for sure on profitability and return on investment. So my question is probably the question of all the other OEM is how we could improve the system of the excise tax uh, to make sure that before engaging a new project, we will end with a sustainable outcome, both for Malaysia and also for export market. Thank you. So on this uh, question, um, actually this uh, has met many um, companies have raised this, especially in your industry, the auto industry. Um, it is something that we are looking at. Uh, basically, just for the rest uh, of information is that they want, they, the industry wants better visibility uh, before bringing something to know, as, as, for example, a simple thing like pricing, right? Uh, rather than waiting for, until the car is ready or car arrives, then the price is decided. Uh, it's better to have uh, so-called uh, uh, matrix, so you know where you will fall and therefore can plan and do the pricing uh, early. Um, that is being done um, through MIDA, um, uh, and of course with us as well. Um, they are spearheading this uh, initiative. Uh, it's hopefully, uh, I'm not sure the timeline, I, I do believe they have shared with me, but I, I'm afraid I can't remember uh, the timeline, but it is something that many uh, of the companies uh, in this industry have asked for, uh, and I'm fully supportive, and I, I quite understand uh, why we should have this, especially when other countries also have this. Uh, it, gives, it gives more transparency as well uh, to the whole process. Uh, so I'll come back to you, um, but it is, uh, something that the government is looking at uh, right now. In terms of timeline, I'm not so sure. I hope it's sooner rather than later. But it is 
important for the for the industry to have that this visibility. I understand. Thank you. For the second question, we'd like to invite one Asri Ramayanti, Country Director of Schneider Malaysia. Yeah, thank you. My name is Astri from Schneider Electric. So our company, Schneider Electric, is really focused on the energy management and automation solution. Is the name of the company again? Sorry. Schneider. Schneider. Astri yeah. from Schneider Electric. Okay. Uh, our company is really focused on the energy management and automation, but on top of that, we also focus on the digital transformation. And we are very uh, uh, curious on your one of the focus on the budget 2021 is in the area of digitalization transformation. Mm. So the question is, uh, because this is very relevant uh, because of the uh, COVID-19 to focus on the uh, digitalization, that's why we see lots of opportunity for Malaysia to increase the competitiveness compared to the other country. It's really how to attract the FDI uh, for the data center especially. And uh, the question is really how we can, the government is attract the investment for the data center because we see lots of the uh, priority. Yes, very important on data for quite more, but data center digitalization is uh, something that we can improve and I believe the infrastructure is ready. So. Uh, how we can support this is very important. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I thought Schneider from Indonesia just now. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, the we have uh, uh, announced in the budget some allocation for digitalization. Uh, in fact, uh, it is uh, allocation to especially high technology activities. Um, if I'm not mistaken, also on innovation R&D and also skills development, especially for IR 4.0. Um, so, you know, we have announced uh, various measures uh, to develop and attract investments uh, into the space. Uh, some of the measures are uh, Dana Panjana, where we allocated um, about 600 million ringgit of funding. Uh, this is to support digitalization of Malaysian businesses uh, by channeling funding uh, from international investors as well. We match one-to-one -one, uh, into the local venture capital space. Uh, also, in an effort to develop the uh, science and technology, as well as to support innovation, uh, the government has also allocated around 400 million ringgit uh, just for R&D uh, purposes, including several ministries and agencies. So we are trying to refocus and relook re at how we disperse this money, but uh, we have an R&D uh, budget that it will be centralized uh, in the government. Additionally, we have introduced various tax measures. I think you've seen this before, uh, including offering tax rate of 0% for 10 years, right? Uh, and can be renewed for another 10 years uh, with tax rate of up to 10% uh, of ventures that goes into research and producing a vaccine, for example. Uh, this is including a COVID-19 vaccine. So on the healthcare medical equipment side. And we also have the high technology fund that's worth about 500 million ringgit uh, that will be provided by our central bank uh, to support high technology and innovative uh, companies. Uh, the fund will enable Malaysian companies uh, to, to remain competitive in the global supply chain and maintain a supply chain ecosystem and protect uh, high skilled jobs. With regards to your question on the uh, data center, um, the government has set up the Digital Council and Fourth IR Council, chaired by the Prime Minister. We had our first meeting about three weeks ago, uh, and we are announcing our blueprint by end of the year. Uh, which includes, uh, you know, having uh, government uh, using cloud, uh, cloud first policy um, and various other initiatives that we'll be announcing. Uh, so that is something that we're looking at uh, and it will be announced by, if the plan to announce is by middle of the year. So uh, maybe in the next two weeks, you will hear an announcement on this uh, method by the, by the Prime Minister uh, as he chairs the digital, Malaysia digital economy. Uh, and. With the announcement, they will also make a few announcements on the investments that are expected to come uh, with line with the announcement on our blueprint. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. So mm. something to look forward to in the in the blueprint. Uh, yes, yes something. Good. Okay. Thank you. We'd like to invite Madam Camille the Nataya, General Manager, Malaysia Singapore Brunei for Sanfi Pastel. Can come here, please. Yes, thank you. 
So I need to get closer to my place. Not that easy for short sure, people. Um, PMYV Minister, thank you very much for receiving us. So my name is Camille. Um, I'm representing Sanofi at the World today, which is a pharmaceutical industry company mm. um, covering all drugs from diabetes, cardiovascular diseases to hemophilia, rare diseases. Um, consumer health product as well as vaccines. And actually, I'm uh, leading here the uh, vaccine business in Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, we have been partnering with the uh, Malaysian government for the last 10 years, providing um, vaccines for the babies. So we are really considering ourselves as a, a public health partner. And in this quality, we really want to applaud the move of the government for the allocation of the budget for the COVID-19 vaccine but as well for the pneumococcal vaccination for the kids. Yes, yes, we yeah. did that. Yeah. And yeah. Um, uh, because today, even more than before, uh, we all know that vaccines are the uh, most successful and cost-effective solution, sometimes actually mm. more than many times, cost-saving solution uh, to and, and the vaccine group as well now. Clearly, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not part of them. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm working with your team to fight against them, actually. Um, um, so clearly, it's, it's the solution to prevent this, and in the situation that we are today, the collapse of the healthcare system of the economy. So, but when we are looking at uh, on the situation, on a daily situation, aside from the exceptional one with COVID-19, the allocation of budget for a preventive measure like vaccination in adults is quite limited in Malaysia. And while we know when worldwide, actually, everyone is looking for measures like flu vaccination for the adults, looking at benefits that are going beyond the maintenance of the healthcare system, but also promoting economic growth, would it be something that the government would consider after the crisis, obviously, for the mm. future and for the adults in Malaysia? Yeah. Okay, I think um, we are aware um, that vaccines are among the most successful and cost-effective, like you said, uh, public health tools uh, for preventing disease and health. Um, overall, actually, in its result, does decrease the healthcare costs, right, uh, in the longer term. But without considering whether it is uh, for children, like you said just now, or adults, uh, decision regarding vaccination uh, against the kind of diseases is made of government, is made by the government, is based on uh, uh, the impact of such diseases on Malaysia, including on the public health and, and on the economy. So we, we do look at that. Uh, so in the case, I think you mentioned on the influenza, right? So, for the time being, Malaysia actually doesn't have any immediate plan uh, to subsidize the cost uh, of such vaccination today. today. I mean, I'm not saying that we won't, uh, because the influenza uh, vaccine is actually readily available in the market, uh, including in private hospitals and clinics uh, for the people of Malaysia. Uh, in Budget 2021, uh, we have given some tax relief uh, for vaccination, about to 1,000 uh, ringgit for vaccination expenses. Uh, furthermore, I think, as you correctly said just now, considering the limited resources uh, and our you know, current priorities, which is to uh, combat COVID-19, uh, Malaysia is really currently focusing a lot of its effort uh, on vaccination uh, for COVID-19. But I'm not saying that in the future we won't look at this, uh, but it's something that uh, we have to prioritize for now. Uh, and also, like I said, um, we need to uh, do, this is the Ministry of Health, uh, again, you know, um, they have looked at the impact of such diseases uh, on Malaysia and then the impact on public health and economy, I think. So that's something that is a balance uh, that they have to, 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 to make. Uh, a, decision, a decision on the balance, of course there is trade-off, but I think for now uh, there is no plans, uh, to be very honest with you, on, on when it comes to influenza. Thank you. Next, we will allow the gentleman now to speak, <laughs> the three ladies. Uh, we'd like to invite Mr. Justin Hashim, Director and Head of Investment Banking, BMP Paribas. Hi, Gato. Thanks for having us. I now sit on this side of the table after 10 years at Kazana. <laughs> um, so, I thought a bit a quick spiel about BNP. So, this bank has been present in uh, Malaysia for a while now, since 1974, actually. Um, we had its full banking license in 2010, and we've got a proper Islamic uh, BNP Najma with windows since 2012. Uh, so, you know, I guess um, uh, lately where we have been focusing our efforts on is on 
sustainability linked uh, products and green bonds. So locally, uh, we're working with the likes of Petronas and Tenaga International. From a country standpoint, what we actually have done uh, recently, earlier this year, was work with the Indonesian government to do a US green bond suku. Mm. You know, that was very well received. So I guess uh, my question as part of... That was with CNB or maybe? We No, there's a few, it's a syndicate. Uh, I think it's a uh, CNB. Yeah, yeah. So I guess um, my question is for on the Malaysian side. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. On the Malaysian side, are you looking to do something similar um, uh, for, for Malaysia? Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, so in the budget, I did not talk about uh, green financing uh, and about the importance of that uh, to, to support uh, um, the SDG goals that we have signed up for in the Paris Agreement. Um, so we will, the, the answer is we will be issuing our first sovereign uh, sustainability bonds or SUKU in 2021, uh, most probably in dollars, right? Uh, but I need to uh, caution you that we might not pay fees for that. Because the investment banks are very uh, aggressive. When he was in the Kazana, he squeezed all the investment banks you know, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, asked them to do it for free for league table purposes. So maybe this time around we will do the same uh, in MOF. Uh, but anyway, this is in part of our plan to you know, pivot Malaysia into a more prosperous, uh, sustainable, and inclusive future. Uh, and in line with what I just said about the UN uh, SDG goals, you know, the 17 SDG goals. Uh, the proceeds from the issuance will therefore be earmarked uh, for green initiatives and projects. Right? Um, this year, we actually issued uh, Suku Prihati, which is more retail, uh, which was oversubscribed. We targeted 500 million and we got 100, 666 million. It's small uh, because it was more retail. Uh, the proceeds of this issuance was utilized for connectivity in rural schools, uh, research and infectious disease, and also financing for micro enterprises. As for debt capital management, uh, whether it's, it's whether we issue conventional or green uh, sukuk, the government actually will focus on sourcing its financing uh, from at the right time. Right? I'm not saying just for domestic market. Uh, although we know that domestically there is uh, ample uh, liquidity, uh, but again, for, for purposes of benchmarking, we may look at uh, issuing a foreign uh, exchange, a foreign denominated uh, bond. Um, but there will be uh, some cost to that, you know, and there will be some foreign exchange risk exposure if we do that. So it depends on how well you pitch this. Uh, so yeah, that's to my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I would like to switch uh, to, this is an infrastructure question, I'm sure. Uh, mm. Mr. Jerome Bermi, Managing Director, Asia Pacific for Colas Rail, Malaysia. Good evening, YB Minister. Thank you for having us around this table. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm here in the name of Coras Rail. Coras Rail is an EPC contractor for providing a railway system. In a nutshell, uh, we don't do civils. Uh, we are providing, uh, designing, procuring all the systems which make the train running. Uh, we, we've been working uh, in Malaysia for a while now, uh, and uh, we had our first project in Southeast Asia, here in Malaysia, and uh, we are now using Malaysia as a hub for the region, and uh, we are performing some contracts uh, uh, across the region in uh, four other countries. Uh, yes, of course, my question will be about uh, railway infrastructure. <laughs> railway is an old business, it was a very great business to have, and uh, I would like to know uh, What's going to be the timeline for MRT3 and HSR, which are the two flagships projects in the, in the railway business? Uh, and of course, uh, if I could know a little bit more, how do you, how do you uh, target to, uh, to procure this? Is it going to be a public procurement, a PPPs, international funding? That would be my question. Thank you. Yes, uh, on the, the two big projects that are new that uh, we which I read in my budget speech. One is MRT3. Uh, MRT3, we are preparing the documents for tender. Um, uh, it will be a tender process. 
Um, he has, of course, a lot of projects. You know, it's a, a big project. And it's, it's our circle line, basically. Um, so the decision is to tender it out, uh, and we are just you know, preparing the memo to start uh, the process of preparing uh, for tender. So that's something that we uh, are doing at the Ministry of Finance, working through uh, the various uh, relevant uh, departments. Um, so we have to wait for that, but that's the decision uh, for now. On HSR, I think if you read the news yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, the Prime Minister had a conversation also with the President of Singapore, no, with the Prime Minister of Singapore. Um, you know, we are in a committee uh, looking at that. Um, of course, HSR is a, um, a, uh, an important part of our um, economy. Um, however, you know, we still feel that um, we make sense to discuss this with Singapore. Um, our, ideally, we still want to have this with Singapore, although we have studied both options with or without Singapore, uh, because the multiplier impact to the country is, is a very positive one, uh, even if we do without Singapore. Uh, but having said that, I think the multiplier will be even more uh, if with Singapore. Uh, in terms of timeline, uh, it's until end of December. Uh, we have at the end of December to uh, conclude our negotiation with Singapore. The reason why we're negotiating still with Singapore is because when the government came in, uh, this government came in, we wanted to renegotiate uh, some of the terms, right? So, and obviously Singapore have its, uh, has the reservations on this, um, but it is a process that is ongoing and hopefully can be concluded by end of the year. Uh, but what we are saying now, I mean, is that we still think, I mean, it is not a decision yet, but we feel that uh, HSR is still a positive impact to the economy, uh, with or without Singapore. Um, so most probably a decision you will hear soon. Uh, uh, by end, of, it's only a month left, um, so we, we should come to a conclusion soon. Um, and it, and if we do proceed, it will be based on again a tender, because it's such a big uh, project. Actually, the MRT three and HSR in terms of valuation is not far off in terms of the value of the contracts. And of course, don't forget, uh, we have the, uh, the, 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 what do you call it, the RTS, right? I think we have the um, Glen Valley Double Track as well, right? Uh, phase one, uh, which is the Gamas JB Double Track as well, right? So there's a few uh, that are ongoing, uh, which will have a positive impact also to the economy. But those are the two new ones, yeah, MRT3 and HSR. And the financing um, for that mixer, PPP or... Uh, so if it's tender, usually it's, uh, it is a government, uh, it's a direct uh, government from our development expenditure. Yeah. If because, I am... because uh, from our experience, that's still the cheapest way uh, for the government in terms of cost. Um, unless we do privatization, but that's not in the cuts. What about PDP model, Minister? Is, is the government open, still open to PDP? Right now, we have not looked at it seriously. Um, so for now, we are still looking at uh, the DE, uh, just putting an allocation to our uh, development expenditure to fund uh, this. Uh, definitely not deferred payment, no. Okay, thank you. Next, we'd like to invite Mr. Kirk. Berlian, Chief Technology Officer, Permitex Synergy Resources, Jumon, please. Thank you very much, Nato. Uh, thank you very much for having us around this table today. So yes, my name is Kurt Berlian. I represent Permitex Synergy Resources, a group of Bumi Putra companies in Malaysia. Uh, we have around 2,500 staff and 18 factories over Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei. Mm. So, why am I in this uh, French Chamber of Commerce with Malaysia is because we have attracted with the help of Maidia, of Maida, technologies coming from France, from three different companies to manufacture their products and uh, to manufacture these products for the APAC region, for all the Asia, Asia Pacific region. Um, I will not have a real question actually, but um, my comment is that I have been able to, to supply some equipment uh, in terms of electromechanical equipment, in terms of automotive equipment and others to every country in APAC region, except Malaysia. Uh, 
Except omission. Yes. Why is that? Yeah, actually, this is my question. But <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said you're not going to ask a question. <laughs> yes. I don't know if it's easy to answer that, but uh -huh. that was my my comment on that. So how can I how can we go forward and find a way? We had Mida, M10, and all these guys. I have been through all the channels uh, with GLC companies, Petronas, TNB, and all, and um, no no real support. So that was this is just a comment and not a question. But mm, sure. Just but what, 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 when you went through this uh, process of meeting the GLCs and uh, MIDA and all that, were they able to explain to you uh, why it was? No, no. Actually, I'm I'm waiting to be assessed. I'm waiting to be tested, to be to be audited, to see if I'm able to supply in the, the quality they need with all their requirements. Mm. But we are not even going through this process. So we stuck even at the yes, at the very. Early, early, early stage. stage. We, we have been through many people and it's, it's a bit difficult for us to understand because Maida invested huge amount of money on our company so we can... So uh, Maida is also invested? Yes, yes, yes. Actually, well, we have very, to very, very, very can you Can you, can you uh, give me a note later to my team? Just, yes. Just quite Actually, curious. This, this is what I would like. Yeah, yeah that would be helpful. I'm quite uh, curious as well, especially when the government is also involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we have yeah. the 50-50 grant and some investment has been done on several of our factories, especially to reach some um, manufacturing uh, capabilities and to fill up these technologies that we import. So, yes, that's the thing. We have sold in Philippines, in Vietnam, Indonesia, and all the Indonesia. My guys, uh, are they pursuing this? Yeah, yeah, they are. They, they, they're they helping. They yeah. help us a lot. Really, they help us a lot. They came to with us to France to meet these companies. They, they, they gave us the grant. When we reached, when we were back in Malaysia, we don't know who to talk to. So mm. supposedly it should be the GLC companies that should be like a VDP programs and these kind of things. Yeah, that, yeah correct. We, we did not manage to... Wh wh which GLC are the one that, you, that requires this technology? Number one, Petronas. Petronas. Number one, okay. Petronas and TNB are the uh, two so companies like that really are, are... We can actually make hundreds of millions of savings compared to the purchase of this equipment out of Malaysia. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank for you that. very much. Thank you. So please uh, write a note to uh, Minister's office and follow up. Thank yeah, you. The, the team is behind you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, next question is uh, to a sector very important to our economy, the oil and gas sector. So I'd like to invite mm. uh, Mr. Christoph Dioga. Vice President Subsea Asia Pacific Technic FMC. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dato. Thank you uh, again for uh, having us here. So, yes, I'm Christophe Dumagar, I'm the Vice President for uh, Subsea for uh, Technic FMC. So, as you might know, Technic FMC is an oil and gas contractor uh, for engineering and EPC. Uh, obviously supporting Petronas here in Malaysia, but uh, we are also obviously operating uh, everywhere in, uh, in Asia Pacific. We have a long history with, uh, with Malaysia, uh, where we uh, uh, established our regional hub uh, almost 40 years ago. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, Technip FMC, and uh, I would say, like the oil and gas uh, and this contracting industry, uh, I think is fairly well aligned with uh, the three main objectives of the uh, Malaysia 2021 budget, uh, looking at the well-being of people, business continuity, and uh, resilience. And my question uh, for today uh, would be about uh, resilience. You know, you know that uh, Malaysia oh, is about what? resident resilience. Oh, resilience. resilience. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. You know, uh, Malaysia is a recognized uh, hub uh, worldwide for oil and gas engineering and uh, deep water, uh, offshore deep water. Uh, thanks to the effort of uh, the uh, Malaysian government deployed over the last, I would say, 15 years to support the industry and attract investment. Obviously, you also know that 2020 has been a very challenging year for the oil and gas industry, mm -hmm. obviously with the COVID yeah. and also the oil price. Yeah. So my question is, uh, uh, has the government uh, some plan, you know, to support the industry? 
uh, and for, for, for Malaysia to keep its uh, leadership position in this uh, strategic domain, oil and gas, but also to use this uh, regional uh, and uh, worldwide uh, leadership position uh, for, uh, let's say, developing a new leadership in terms of uh, energy transition. Thank you. Um, well, this issue, uh, if we look at, uh, for everyone's information, we have involved many uh, captains of this industry during the budget process. Uh, we understand the challenges faced, especially for the oil and gas sector. Uh, you know, even before I joined the government, uh, there was a lot of challenges to face even before the COVID, right? Uh, um, it was like triple whammy for this industry. Um, you know, we, 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 we looked at uh, uh, many proposals that, uh, that came in. Um, and if you look at um, the support that we want to give uh, to this industry, um, we can we try to, you know, facilitate a business friendly environment for all uh, businesses, uh, both existing and, and new, right? Um, we also have identified measures to offer long term uh, and sustainable growth prospects for investors, especially in the oil and gas sector, which we have you know, built for decades, right, to be where we are uh, today and to remain, in, especially to Malaysia, in Malaysia and grow. Uh, uh, growth, you know, we have the tech team here as well who's trying to see how we can help, you know, from a tech perspective and also the non-perspective, non-tech perspective. Um, so, you know, for, 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 for this industry, I must say that um, we, we, we are trying to engage MIDA as well to see how we can look at this holistically, right? Uh, you know, many uh, form of uh, you know, uh, support that has to come in, um, given that we don't want to lose the capacity when this industry comes back, right? Well, what we don't want to see is uh, we we let it uh, you know decline so much that when it comes out again, we, you know we've we've lost all the all the headway that we made for so long. Um, aerospace is also another industry, just to be honest with you, uh, that we think that be of course medical health medical equipment. There's a few industries that we feel um, that during this COVID nineteen uh, we not, we must not let it you know feel too much or affect it too much, or else the country also will suffer in the longer term, right? So we need some support. Um, so we welcome any proposals. Uh, there has been some proposals uh, coming in. Uh, it, because oil and gas sector is very wide, uh, it's a very broad. Uh, so we're looking at suggestions and collaboration from everyone uh, to discuss this. Uh, I must say that so far, uh, the local companies have come in uh, to give some ideas and proposals on this, uh, uh, this part, I think we need to start uh, engaging uh, international companies as well who are here, right? I think we have not, to be honest, we have not uh, done that. And I've told uh, Maida and Miti that we need to do this as well. Um, so that we can't do it alone uh, domestically. Um, we need it to do together. And in fact, if you look at it, uh, Malaysia's industrial and gas industry is driven uh, both uh, by international and domestic uh, players who have built to where we are today. Uh, we have the talent. Right, uh, and we've built that over years. Uh, we don't want to to lose that, and we have the whole supply chain, right, of of, of, of support services as well. Uh, in, in this, um, we have talked, we've spoken to um, uh, uh, Bank Mamuna just to give you uh, to, to understand on the financial part. So they are they are discussing with other banks uh, to see how we can assist. Uh, but Petronas and the others also have are uh, also coming in to give ideas uh, on how to make sure that this industry is not too severely affected. Uh, that we we lose the capacity. Um, so, you know, um, for MIDA, a um, lot of investments have been looked at, but we, we need to uh, really um, spend more time on this. I agree with you. So thank you for that. Maybe we can talk to technique. I mean, you, we've been working closely with Petronas as well. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And for your information, uh, I mean, Mr. Technique has been here for a long, long time. How many years? Uh, 40 years. 40 years. So, long time. Yeah. Long time. Thank you. Now, we'd like to invite Mr. David Ng, Country General Manager for International uh, SOS. David, please. Uh, good afternoon, YB. Thank you for having us here. Um, my name is David Ng. I'm the uh, Managing Director of uh, International SOS Malaysia and uh, Myanmar as well. Um, 
we are in the business of, uh, of uh, medical and uh, security services assistance. So during this COVID crisis, we have helped uh, bring hundreds of uh, Malaysians uh, back safely uh, to Malaysia and also supporting uh, companies on workforce resilience and uh, business continuity and sustainability as well. Um, in the near future, I guess uh, countries will start opening their borders uh, for international travelers. Mm. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to share with YB that uh, uh, International SOS together with the uh, International uh, Chamber of Commerce have developed this uh, so-called uh, digital pass using blockchain technology. So uh, it's, uh, it's uh, storing digital certificates like COVID certificates and, uh, and in the future vaccine certificates uh, digitally uh, in a mobile app. And this enables travelers to uh, uh, carry these uh, digital certificates and mm. uh, uh, with a QR code where they can do the check-in at the airport uh, through immigration uh, seamlessly and it helps to facilitate uh, travels. Which, uh, which country have started to use this? So uh, Singapore has already approved this uh, digital pass. Uh, Singapore Changi, uh, together with the uh, immigration, has approved. Okay. So we are doing a pilot with uh, Cathay Pacific because there will be this travel bubble between Hong Kong and Singapore. Yep. So Cathay Pacific will be our pilot to, uh, to use this digital pass uh, to enable uh, uh, safe travel between the two countries. So we are wondering whether the uh, Malaysian government will support this global initiative uh, to, 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 to facilitate uh, business travels. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, well this is good. Uh, I mean, I didn't know about this, uh, to be very honest. Um, we, uh, we are meeting tomorrow on the National Security Council to talk about the CFCO, which actually ends on the 6th of, not actually ends, I mean, the current <laughs> CFCO uh, is supposed to end. 6th of December. So there is a discussion whether to continue that and if do we do in what form and all that, right? So I'm coming on the angle of economy, right? Uh, so you know where I'm going to stand. Um, so of course there is a, like I said, there's a bit, there's a balance between lives and livelihoods, there's a trade-off. So we, we're discussing together with Embassy of Health uh, and the various other relevant ministries. Uh, one of the big uh, issues is on the travelers, uh, the bubble, which, which we were in a very advanced stage. Uh, at a time before this third wave came in. And of course, you know, if you see from the Malaysian reaction, we always, I mean, it's recorded by them, we sometimes overreact uh, on certain uh, things, right? But um, when it comes to health, um, we want to listen to the Minister of Finance. Right? So we need to look at this objectively based on data. Um, on the business travelers, I'm not sure whether you are aware. Uh, at the Economy Action Council and then at the National Security Council, this was discussed uh, and approved. And we have a one stop center. Uh, what's it called again? The one stop center? Uh, X, my something. Um, where it consists of MIDA, uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Immigration Department, which is the Home Ministry, and also the Ministry of Health. This is where business travelers uh, can apply uh, within five days, so now even three days. They can get approval to come to Malaysia. Uh, they have to be um, uh, sought before the coming and also when, upon arrival. And once you get your results, you can go to your meetings. You do not need to be quarantined. Uh, and once, but of course, you have to share your itinerary of your meetings in Malaysia. And once you're done, then you uh, can go back. Um, uh, we've got a few hundred people we've gone through. In fact, a few thousand applications already. Uh, so it's it's it's. For business travelers, it's not an issue uh, so far, uh, since we had to introduce this, I think, three weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I can, uh, I, there's a website for it as well. Um, but for tourists, I think that is a, a bigger challenge, I think. Uh, although uh, last week at the National Security Council, the Ministry of Tourism fought very hard to open at least the domestic tourism first, right? Uh, right now, as you know, uh, we still are not allowed to cross uh, states, right, uh, for tourism, unless for work. Right? So then, um, then in international tourism, also they are looking at various other ways, uh, for example, city to city, you know, um, I don't know if it's beach holiday or, or uh, you know, certain kind of tourism where it doesn't involve a lot of interaction, that means you don't really travel to the city, um, so create its own bubble and 
you know, um, they have your own bus. So all that are being you know, thinking of creative ways to reduce uh, the, the, the rate of infection uh, if any um, for, for tourists to come. That is still in discussion. Um, again, it really depends on how we can tackle the COVID-19 issue. I mean, if you look at the report by, I just saw the report by the Hopkin uh, University, our death rate in Malaysia is at 0.7%, right? It's less than 1% of people who are infected. Um, but but the, the reason for that is because we are very, very strict. Uh, you know, even in Europe, I'm not sure about in France, but I know in UK because my daughter is there, uh, children is uh, so anyway, uh, UK, the schools are considered essential services. So schools are not closed. I'm not sure whether that's the same in, in France. Um, whereas in Malaysia, all schools are closed, right? Uh, we just, does have an indirect impact to the economy uh, as people, you know, can't be as productive uh, given that they have the kids at home, right? Uh, even work at home becomes difficult. Right. So these are some of the examples, uh, you know, the, the thing that we've seen in the fourth quarter numbers are GDP numbers is not as uh, strong as we earlier projected, simply because um, the retail sector is very much affected and of course tourism as well. Tourism domestic was quite strong at one time. Uh, so retail, um, we are still a consumption based economy. We've seen uh, a lot of people who are very scared to go to the malls because of all this, right? Uh, but it's slowly improving, even traveling in a car, so we can't travel more than three people. People are questioning that initially it was two than three. So to your question, I think if we can, you know, we have to do it gradually, uh, but I'm quite interested uh, to know about this. Um, I'm not sure whether you've spoken to the uh, relevant ministry. Uh, we have approached uh, the uh, uh, Malaysia Airport authorities. How about so, the Malaysia Airlines and all that? Uh, yeah. Malaysia Airlines, no, not yet. Okay, I'll talk to me. Malaysia Airport is under us, under yeah. Ministry of Finance, so yeah. I can try and find yeah. out. Because then I can raise it at the National Security yeah. Council. Just, yeah. you know, they need information and data and, you know, yeah. to, to mitigate some of their concerns, right? Yeah. Um, because they say that um, compared to tai Taiwan or Korea or Japan, um, the reason why um, they can be more open in their approach uh, when it's tackling COVID is because uh, the compliance to SOP is much higher, yeah. right? Uh, in those countries compared to Malaysia, um, so the, so that's that's the concern of the Ministry of Health because if we are Malaysians are more compliant, then with SOP, then they can be a bit more liberal uh, in their approach towards uh, opening up uh, some of the, the sectors. Thank you, mm. uh, David. Minister, we have just a few more minutes yeah. left. Yes, you, it's the, okay. Um, yeah. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Thank you. There are some questions from my watch. Sorry. There's um, a few questions from our attendees in um, on, on the webinar. Mm. Um, so with a few uh, minutes that we have left, if I can pose some quick yeah, five please. questions to you. Uh, first question, I, I suppose no dialogue will be complete without the tax and uh, finance question. Tax yes. reforms reduction of corporate income tax to be competitive with our uh, ASEAN peers. Um, would you comment on that, Minister? Yep. Well, we have the tax division here, but I'll try and attempt to answer. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, if you look at the tax rate for us versus other countries, uh, especially uh, some of the uh, peers, we are higher uh, for corporate tax rate and also to success income tax rate, of course, lower than France. Uh, but if we look at uh, where we are in terms of our collection, uh, revenue-wise, revenue to GDP, if I'm not mistaken, is around what, 17%? Right? About 17%, whereas in other countries, especially OECD countries, around 30%. So we can reduce corporate tax when we have the right uh, ratio, right? Because as it is, we compare to other countries, um, other developing countries even, our efficiency in terms of collection is very low. Uh, that means there's a lot of leakages, perhaps, um, but it also means that um, our tax base is not wide enough. Um, because seventeen percent, just just for taxpayers, let's just look at taxpayers. If I'm not mistaken, about two plus million, two point two million taxpayers we have. Two point four million, uh, only only two point four million Malaysians pay tax because they of the. You know, 
Yeah, and then the corporate tax as well. Um, if we look at it, uh, it's, you know, in terms of revenue, it is relatively low. And, and, and at one time it was high a uh, year, uh, I guess because of GST, right? Uh, but it's still lower uh, than uh, other uh, developing uh, countries of our peers, uh, people within our, our category. So that is the reason why we, we can't. But having said that, you know, the lower the profit you make, the less tax you pay. Right? It's, uh, so those who make money, those who lose money, they say, don't worry, you don't have to pay tax. Uh, during COVID-19, because if you, got, you don't have money, you don't take the tax. Because I got some companies who come here, oh, we lost money. Um, can you reduce the tax? I say, yeah, we can reduce the tax for you, because if you lose money, you don't get tax. <laughs> right, right, you don't get tax, if you lose money. <laughs> yeah, but that's the reason, uh, that I know, uh, we, can't, we can't afford as a country uh, our revenue. Even today, this year, our revenue base has gone down close to 40 billion, right, on just income, on income tax, 40 billion ringgit. Can you give us a, a flavor of uh, or a hint of what's to come? GST, digital tax, capital gains mm -hmm. tax. Uh, well, digital tax is again you know, discussion with the OECD. Um, there is a, a process ongoing. We, we we can't do it alone. We have to do it together uh, with what other other developed countries are doing. I think most developed countries are looking at this. Um, GST. I think again um, we are open. We have a committee set up. In fact, since two thousand and nineteen. To look at uh, our tax uh, policy, um, but the problem is for me, whatever decision we make, of course, there's certain to an extent a political angle, right? Because people think uh, that uh, GST is, is, is means higher price, but uh, as we know, it's a more form of uh, fairer tax. But in terms of timing, uh, in, a, in the midst of a major crisis, uh, one that we've not seen before, is an unprecedented crisis, uh, to introduce uh, something. Uh, very new uh, and very big and in the form of taxation uh, can really backfire uh, right? because you don't want to uh, disrupt the economic uh, recovery uh, by introducing any new form of taxation uh, as that will confuse uh, the market and give the wrong signal. Uh, but having said that, um, to be sustainable in the longer run, we really need, really need to relook at our tax base or else you know, it's going to be difficult for us to, to fund uh, the economy. Uh, the government to fund economic growth for the country. Um, a couple quick five questions, mm. Minister. Future and support for Malaysia Airlines. This obviously came from one mm. of our aerospace uh, members mm. uh, on, on the web. So can you comment on that, please? Yeah. Actually, this question was raised uh, during my winding up speech in Parliament. Uh, one of the opposition MPs, in fact, three of the opposition MPs raised this question. What will happen to Malaysia Airlines? So Malaysia Airlines, as you know, structurally, is owned by Kazana. Kazana is our uh, sovereign arm, uh, wealth fund, which obviously owned by Ministry of Finance. Um, and the, and the, at this point in time, um, there is a restructuring happening between the Malaysia Airlines and the creditors. Um, it is, I mean, I think all of you in the room know that in any country, airline industry is quite strategic, uh, especially for Malaysia. Um, uh, there is a lot of spillover effect of having uh, your, your own airline to support the growth, uh, especially the tourism and, and the economy. Uh, but there is a limit to that as well. Uh, just since we, government, took over Malaysia Airlines in 2005, if I'm not mistaken, we have spent 28 billion ringgit uh, to support this airline uh, called Malaysia Airlines. Um, but I think the commitment is to continue to support uh, provided the, the commercial or the business model is sustainable. Um, so they are saying that it is sustainable provided they can restructure. But how they restructure, they, can, they say they need to talk to the creditors, um, that, which are happening now. Uh, so if hopefully uh, they've given a timeline at the end of the year to talk to the creditors. So the creditors can agree to a restructuring plan um, that makes sense, uh, then I think uh, it will be okay uh, for Malaysia Airlines or else it's better to start again from scratch uh, rather than have this very high uh, cost. So there's a, I think you've heard about contingency plan where we might use Firefly uh, as, as the vehicle going forward. No media here, Minister. Um, mm. Mass and Asia merger? I think that one is a commercial decision. I don't think, I don't think Asia and Asia Airlines are in talking, uh, talking about merger. I think they're all focusing on uh, reviving the, the, the companies, uh, but uh, I'm not aware of any uh, discussions of merger between 
uh, both uh, Malaysia Airlines and Asia. Okay. Uh, last question, Minister, um, just to leave it on a feel good factor. We all mm. are very excited about the vaccine that we hear in the market. Malaysia too has a plan. Yes. Um, apart from what we've read in the media, could mm. you give us a highlight on that? And also, when um, a related tourism question, when do you think our borders can open up? Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> the, I'll answer the sec second uh, part first, the tourism. So the tourism, if we look at it, um, it really depends on um, the COVID numbers in Malaysia. I think it's very hard for us to push uh, to open the borders um, to tourism. Um, but I think the business sector, we are beginning to open up. Um, but even tourism, I think, uh, I, I feel that we, 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 we it's too difficult for, for, for us at the moment um, to open the borders. Um, but I, what I wanted to, to have at least what Singapore is doing, have a, you know, look at the country. If it's a low case, then we should open up and look at the city, you know. So, you know, it, it, it may be selective, right, so rather than uh, have a blanket approval for all. Uh, and then your first question is on the uh, vaccine. Um, the government, uh, the cabinet uh, has agreed uh, to sign uh, we are a member of the COVAX right so that is happening uh, and then we have just ordered from Pfizer um, the plan uh, I went to parliament to get allocation of three billion ringgit this is enough to vaccinate 70 percent of the population uh, which we feel that's enough for the herd immunity right uh, and if you look at it uh, in terms of timing uh, we should be getting our first uh, delivery in January uh, Pfizer is supposed to give what 20% of our population plus COVID, so that's 30. Uh, we are in talking to, uh, to other new ones, right? They have announced so we, we discussion. Uh, we also discussion the, with other countries as well, uh, both Russia and China as well, uh, and, and of course now in the, you know, in, uh, the other the, other, the other two major ones that we have announced. Uh, they, have, they have announced they have made. UK have. Uh, I think announced that they have approved for emergency use, I believe yesterday, right? Uh, but our DG of Health have taken the stance that we still need more data before we can make. I'm not sure whether France has made the same uh, wait first, right? Yeah. Actually, it's the only EU which is in the same position compared to Britain, so we haven't approved yet. Okay, so, yeah, so we are not, okay. because there were a joke in the, in the social media saying, well, it's good enough for UK, but not good enough for Malaysia. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess EU has the same position, yeah. so can't blame the Malaysian health. Um, anyway, so that, that's, the, that's the thing. Um, um, we, 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 we have a plan, actually, uh, that's been discussed. One, once they arrive, who gets first and all that. I think it's similar to other countries, uh, obviously the frontliners and the people who are in high risk. Uh, before. It's going to be free for all Malaysians, but if you want to we don't know. We, uh, we have not discussed on the private side. Maybe maybe there will be private uh, hospitals making it available. Um, but the plan is to make it free for all Malaysians uh, for this. Well, thank you very much, uh, Minister. We've used up um, a lot of your time. Um, if I may just summarize, thank you very much for your very comprehensive update on the budget and also the answers that you've given to our uh, question today from our members, both present in person and also online. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see from the variety of representation, the variety of sectors that relate to questions, uh, automotive, technology, pharmaceutical, mm -hmm. finance, oil and gas services, uh, not represented here in person today, but maybe on the webinar, you are sportsmen, I mean, Decathlon, they have a very big presence here. Yeah. Uh, as well, of course, the defense sector. So the interest to continue uh, investing and expanding in Malaysia is that yeah. we thank you to, to you and your team at the related uh, ministries for uh, the support. And uh, uh, please um, take it from us that CCIFM will continue to be a very good partner to the Ministry of Finance. We look forward to our continued engagement with you and your team, uh, Minister to help the Malaysian economy grow and boost our business trade and friendship. Thank you. And my, may I invite everyone to give the Minister and his team a round of applause, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zainal, Excellency, uh, for coming here. Um, I hope after the COVID, we can have a more a casual uh, uh, engagement session, whether it is quite formal, and we can have more people to to be uh, involved. Um, 
And again, thank you very much for your time. Please don't be shy on uh, uh, in giving some ideas uh, for us uh, to improve on. And but more importantly, uh, if there are any issues as well um, that especially concerns uh, my ministry, uh, we will you know be more than happy to assist in any way we can. I mean, I mean I've known Dr. Zaina for decades now, uh, ever since your even before. <laughs> I don't know how many days ago, it's been about 15, 15 years ago. Yeah. So you got a good guy here who can, who has, mm -hmm. can be the bridge uh, to us. So thank you again uh, for, all of, for all of you for making time to come all the way here to uh, Portugal. Thank you. Thank you.